Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics. Uh, today is uh, Jobs Friday for the month of uh, April, uh, and I've got a number of my colleagues here to help me out and uh, figure this out. We've got uh, the, my the two co-hosts, Ryan Sweet. Ryan's Director of Real-Time Economics, and um, and you were trash talking me again uh, uh, at me again on uh, Twitter. Uh, I thought I'm would... trash talking. That's not trash talking. No, but you better get used to it. It's gonna be a weekly uh, <laughs> Thursday night tweet. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought I responded in a pretty clever way. The you whole did. I was impressed. Thing. Yeah. Oh, good. It took me a little longer than I would have liked to come up with that retort. <laughs> I, I was. I was impressed that you knew. How do I respond to Ryan's trash talking? Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, it's good. Good to have you, Ryan and um, Chris. Chris Reedy, Deputy Chief Economist. Chris is no trash talker. He doesn't trash talk. He doesn't do that. Down the middle. How you doing? Uh, how you doing, Mark? I'm doing okay. Uh, not not too bad. Um, and we've got uh, Marissa. Marissa Di Natale. Marissa, good to have you uh, back. Hi, hi everyone. Friday. Nice to be here. And uh, Marissa has many bona fides, but uh, I think the key one for today is you were former formerly from the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So you know this data better than anybody. At least that's the rumor. Except maybe your other guest, who was also with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I was going to say, yeah, Dante, Dante D'Antonio. Yeah, Dante did, generally doesn't uh, come on unless the ADP really messes up. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, let me have a little break. Yeah. ADP was pretty close this month. We'll come back probably and talk about that. But uh, way to go, Dante. Uh, it, it, so did you guys overlap at the BLS in any way? No? No, and we weren't. Dante, you weren't in Washington, right? Yeah, I was. We worked in the You were, department. okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because you did state and metro employment, right? No, I did. I did, uh, you did the national. household survey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the unemployment rate, CPS. So, Marissa, when you were at BLS, you focused on the household employment survey, which is obviously a big part of today's numbers. Right. And Dante, you focused on state and metro area employment? Yep. Oh, cool. Very cool. Was one division more prestigious than the other? The national divisions get more attention, obviously, than the Do state. they really? Yeah. How unfair. How unfair. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So you'd be getting, like, uh, Marissa would get a call from, like, the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, assistant secretary of labor, and you get a call from someone from Boise, Idaho. Is that right? Marissa? Like a reporter in Cincinnati, right? That's, a reporter yeah. in Cincinnati. Yeah. Yeah, giving you all kinds of grief for, you know, why was this number, that number? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, but today's Jobs Friday, uh, again, for the month of April. And um, Dante, you want to give us a, a sense of the report? You know, give us a rundown. What did it say? I mean, can we call it business as usual with everything that's going on? But I mean, job growth was right in line, dead in line with what it was last month, you know, in line with averages that we've seen. You know, the industry breakdown of employment was maybe a little bit surprising, I think, in some cases. You know, trade, transportation was up. I think more strongly than I would have expected. Manufacturing was was pretty strong, sort of despite all of the the other headwinds that are out there. Um, but you know, on the establishment side, I think you know is right in line with expectations for the most part. Uh, maybe not Ryan's expectations, but you know, broad expectations. Yeah, Ryan uh, was wrong this month, wasn't he? He was, was. Like, he was overly pessimistic, which is unusual. He yeah. usually nails this number. Just wait till the revisions. <laughs> wait. For the revision. <laughs> oh yeah, the revisions. That's what okay. you're forecasting now. The final revised number is that. Mm -hmm. In the establishment survey, obviously, is the sur so there's a household survey. And that's what uh, Marissa worked on when she was at BLS, and then there's a survey of establishments or businesses, and that's what you're referring to. That the the employment gain there right. was what was it? Four hundred and something. Four hundred and or twenty eight. Four hundred twenty eight thousand. Right. Um. Uh, I did notice going back to the revisions, they were down this month, not big down, but down. Yeah. And that's a change, right? Because for the last more than a year, I think every single month we get upward revisions to the preceding couple of months. This was a little different. And sizable, right? That's... Was it sizable? I thought it was. No, no. It, in previous months, the oh, uh, in up, previous the upper, months, right. Yeah. yeah. These were relatively small and down. Yeah. Do you read anything into that? Is that is there anything uh, inf information in that? 
I think the good news is hopefully it means revisions will be smaller moving forward. I mean, hopefully some of that volatility is getting wrung out. You know, response rates get better. You know, they get a little bit more accurate on the first print again, as we had seen you know, prior to the pandemic. So, well, right. the response rate was low again. Was it was low again? For a typical April, it was low. Right. Maybe. And also the seasonal adjustment factor was small relative to past April. So I think we were setting up for another downward revision. It was oh, pretty I cold, see. wasn't it? It was in. Mm -mm. It's like a hundred thousand less than an average April. Hmm. Well, let's go go back big picture before we seem we want to go right into the DNA of the report. Yeah. Uh, confuse the heck out of everybody, but before we do that, and that's fair game. Uh, I'm sure. Actually, with the statistics game, we're going to go pretty deep into the bowels of this thing. I'm, I can feel it. You know, <laughs> I can feel it right now. But. Going back to the big picture, so what's the big picture here, Dante, in terms of the job market? It's 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 what the job market is strong. It's it's steady and strong. Yeah, I, I, I rolls on. You know, it keeps keeps chugging along as expected, um, despite everything else in the world. Right. So strong job growth, broad based across industries. Okay. And on the household survey side, uh, there felt like there's a, a blemish or two there, though, right? If you, if you rate was unchanged, you know, uh, prime age employment population, I think, ticked down by a tenth. Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, you know, right. The job growth in the household survey was weak. It was down uh, a couple hundred thousand, which, you know, in any given month is not all that surprising to see a divergence like that. But certainly you know, keep an eye on it moving forward. But, yeah, it's quite probably not quite as rosy as the establishment side, but still you know, nothing overly concerning, I don't think. So that dip down in labor force participation, it went from 62.4, which is already pretty low. I mean, it's coming back from the pandemic hit, but it's still not nearly all the way back. We've got a long way to go. Tick down to 62.2. That You didn't read anything into that. One month, I'm not going to worry too much about. You know, if, it, if it ticks down again or stays low next month and the month after that, maybe start to worry, but it may just bounce right back next month too. So, Okay. All right. So, so bottom line, Solid, steady as she goes, kind of, that's your takeaway from the report. It is, yeah. Yeah, okay. Marissa, uh, what do you think? Uh, Dante miss anything? Uh, well, first of all, do you agree with his kind of overall uh, the picture that he painted and um, anything you want to flesh out? Uh, he's right. I mean, it, it's the, a gain of over 400,000 again. So it looks good. And if you take other labor market data into account, like the JOLTS survey that came out this week too, um, which is for the previous month, but Job that all still looks service. pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, again, yes, you don't want to read too much into one month of data, but this was, there were more blemishes in this report than we've seen in a long time. I feel like every month we when we talk about it, we say, oh, it's, you know, it's hard to find something negative in this report. This is the first one where you can find some negative things, particularly on the household survey side. I think that decline in, in the labor force participation rate is interesting, just, and I will probably get into this more, but just in the context of reaching full employment and how much excess labor supply is out there. If you look since the beginning of this year, you're starting to see a slowdown in the number of people coming back into the labor force that had left. So <clears throat> BLS publishes these labor force flows. So you can actually break down in the household survey where people are, the categories people are moving between. So the number of people that are not in the labor force to employed, unemployed to employed, employed to unemployed, et cetera. So you can kind of see all of that. The number of people moving from out of the labor force back into it, whether they're getting jobs or they're looking for jobs, has been trending down since the start of the year. You know, we saw a really strong labor force growth through the end of 2021. That looks like it's weakening. And one of our key assumptions has been there's a lot of excess labor supply out there, right? There were a lot of people that left during the pandemic. Maybe they retired early and they're starting to come back in again, or there were a lot of particularly prime age women who left because of childcare concerns coming back in. We saw that kind of going on through the end of last year. It looks like that's slowing now. Um, so that's, how, how does that I think we're going to get to, we're, we're only a million jobs, right? Away from the pre 
pandemic employment peak if you look at the payroll survey. So we'll get there and, and we'll get there earlier than we were predicting originally. I mean, probably within the next two, three months. Um, but, but it looks like that, that impetus to come back to work may be slowing. Hmm. How do you square that? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe it is consistent with, but the number of people not in the labor force that say they want a job, that still remains a, a bit elevated compared to pre-pandemic. I think it's, I'm rounding like 6 million people are saying that compared to, I want to say 5 million people, you know, right mm -hmm. before the pandemic. So that's about an additional million people that, that I've always thought of that as kind of the folks that would come back in at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, but you're saying, yeah, but that it seems like that hasn't really happened over the last it's happening. It's just happening more slowly. more slowly. You know, there's still people coming in every month from out of the labor force, but the pace of that has slowed significantly this year compared to where it was at the end of last year. Right. So I don't know what, you know, what's spooking people to come back into the labor force. I mean, certainly if there's households where someone isn't working and has the ability to work with inflation, what it is, it's if, if you need another paycheck, this is a great time to come into the labor force, right? Just given the, the huge number of job openings. Um, but it, it just seems like that's slowed since the start of the year. Right, right. Uh, one factoid just to throw into the mix and see what you think. If you look at the participation rate, which did decline from 62.4 to 62.2, all of the decline was for folks with less than a high school degree that fell i want to say about a percentage point you know, a, big, a big decline but the labor force participation for everyone else with a high school degree college degree uh, it either held its own or rose during the month uh I, I don't know how you interpret that my kind of instinct was well that kind of calls into question the data you know it just doesn't feel like something fundamental going on it feels something more related to measurement, seasonal adjustment, you know, whatever. Uh, any, any thoughts around that, comments around that observation? Doesn't it, 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 you, you kind of see how that might correlate with the mix of industries that added strong job growth, you know, had strong job growth last month compared to previous months, like uh, financial services added more jobs, but leisure hospitality, again, added yeah. a lot of jobs, but less than it yeah. normally has, right? Mm -hmm construction less than it normally has so it could just be a industry mix of who's hiring right right okay okay uh so you're it sound, feels like you're saying okay reasonably strong report but maybe not quite as strong as what we've been seeing yeah yeah, yeah. right a blemish or two here or there particularly in the household survey side okay um uh, Ryan, anything to add there on the report? I mean, anything you noticed that we haven't talked about already? Well, if you strip out leisure and hospitality, employment's back to where it was pre-pandemic. So oh, really the weakness is, is isolated to that you know, one segment of the economy. I, I ignore average hour earnings, but the markets are responding to the, the softness in average hour earnings, uh, which were up 0.3% month over month. And there's this calendar quirk because the payroll reference or the household reference week and payroll reference week included the, uh, the 15th of the month. And when that happens, usually average hourly earnings are strong, oh. uh, but that didn't happen this month. So I think people are buying, looking into this and saying, all right, maybe this is a sign that, you know, the labor market's starting to cool off. So, so I, I, I can't, I don't remember the data, but it looked like the, th uh, over the past three months, wage growth. And again, average hourly earnings yeah. is not the greatest number to be looking at because it's affected by the mix of jobs, occupations, industry, so forth and so on. But abstracting from that, the growth uh, in wages over the last three months is meaningfully less than the kind of growth rates we were Correct. getting towards the end of last year. So it might, it might suggest there's some kind of moderation going on in wage growth at this, uh, at this time. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah. And it, okay. markets are getting whipsawed because you know yesterday we got unit labor costs that you know, went through the roof and now we have some softening in average hourly earnings. So until it shows up in the employment cost index, uh, I don't really buy into the, the view that wage growth is meaningfully slowed. So we'll have to wait. You refer, you, you've referred to markets. 
I haven't had a chance. I've, I've been a lot busier than you, Ryan, this morning. So I haven't had a chance to look at markets. Mm-hmm. It's nice, nice that you well, whatever happened to your thumper principle. You know, oh, you, you, yeah, oh, right. we're on a client bro. call and Mark's like, oh, I, you know, I follow the thumper <laughs> principle. He's right. We were on a yeah. call, call, the thumper. Did I, I've told you about the thumper principle, haven't I, on the podcast? Does it, everyone know what the thumper principle I don't, is? I don't know what it is. You I do know. not know what the thumper principle is? No. Okay. okay. Well, have you seen the movie Bambi? <laughs> That's not a trick question. That, that didn't mean come on. I, I was, think I did when I was three. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, I, I watched it many times when really? I was. Well, I was a little more delayed, probably up to <laughs> six or seven years old. I don't know. There wasn't a whole lot of choice. Like, like when you right. were a kid, you had a lot of choice. I had no choice. I had to watch Bambi. And I was, I came from a big family and I was the oldest. So I'm watching, you know, whatever, you know, I have no choice here. Uh, anyway, uh, so you remember Thumper. Thumper yes. is Bambi's friend. Right. I, I, you know, now that I say this, I may have this dead wrong, but this is what I have in my mind. So anyway, Thumper said something that wasn't, you know, it was a little off color. And I think it was Thumper's mom or Bambi's mom. I can't remember which that said, uh, Thumper, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah, that, that resonates with me. I didn't know that quote was attributed to Thumper. Oh, well, well maybe, it's, maybe it's not, but in my mind, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I call it the Thumper principle. Yeah, and it applies to everyone but Ryan. I'm just saying, because you know, you know. we're he's trash talking me. It's fair it's game. Not trash t- <laughs> you think that's trash talking? You, you just wait. I know. I know. I'm, I'm nervous. Um, so markets what, like this or don't like yeah. this? So yeah, what happened? What's going on with markets? When with the market, average yeah. hourly earnings, you said they reacted. I haven't checked the bond market, but the stock market fell off, sell, sold off. So. Oh, so wouldn't I was surprised. Like, I thought you were going to say the opposite. Yeah, yeah I thought you were going to say the opposite. The stock market's interpreting yeah. it one way. The bond market's interpreting it the other way. Oh, I see. So do you think bond, so bond yields are, are uh, came off a little bit then? You, you saw oh. the odds of, you know, the Fed going 75 basis points at an upcoming meeting that came down after the report. And I think that's okay. mostly average hour earnings. Got it. Okay. All right. The 10 years up three basis points. Yeah, I think it might have been up more, even more before the report came out. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, Anything else on on the report, Ryan? You want to call out? No. I I think Mercer and Dante covered it. Yeah. yeah, You know, just if if there's any blanks that we we missed here, we fill any blanks. Anything you'd like to point out? Oh, me. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) Missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think they covered it for the most part. One thing that stuck out or jumped out as I was reading through the industrial detail is the um, looks like uh, all for the ma- the majority of uh, industries are up above the February 2020 level except for leisure hospitality, so now it's it's quite concentrated there, um, so that's good. Construction uh, was weak, or not there wasn't a, a decline, but there's no real acceleration there, so that's. Uh, informative as we think about the housing market. It doesn't look like the activity is really picking up uh, to any degree there. Uh, one other thing that jumped out, just looking at the demographics, I saw that um, uh, African-American men, the participation rate uh, for them uh, did increase this month. Now, those are always a little Again, um, yeah. volatile, but you know, certainly I think uh, good to see something uh, like that and certainly could explain some of the, the weakness perhaps in the unemployment rate uh, overall. That, that is an interesting point. Ryan made it too, that leisure hospitality is the only major sector where employment's not back to pre-pandemic levels. I wonder if we're ever going to get back the those jobs, right? Because it feels like hotels really have kind of changed fundamentally, you know, what they're doing. Like, you know, if you go to a hotel now, you may not get your room cleaned every single day, right? It might, yeah. And the, you can see the staff is much less there's much less staff than there was before behind the desk or at the, at the gym or, you know, wherever you go. Uh, so I wonder if we're ever going back you know, to, to that. Um, Do you think that's an intentional change or is that a change out of necessity because they don't have enough workers that they, they would like to restaff completely and they just can't right now? I, my sense is that at first it, they had no choice. Right. Uh, but I think uh, they're figuring out how to, because this is improvement in productivity. Right. I mean, presumably. Yeah. So I, I think they'd want to hold 
folks that operate hotels and motels and other establishments in that industry would like to hold on to these productivity gains. I would, I would think, so they're going to fight it, you know, by, you know, in, in some of the things that I, you know, I, I, I'm a careful consumer of leisure and hospitality services. I, you know, I travel a lot, not, not as much as I did pre pandemic, but you know, I, I, it feels reasonable to me, right? I mean, if I'm in a hotel room for a couple of nights or three nights, it doesn't really bother me that, it, you know, my room isn't made up, you know, cleaned every single day or, you know, vacuumed every single day. Um, nice to get new towels, but, you know, I can live with that too. Uh, so, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, let's uh, maybe uh, tackle a couple of uh, broader labor market issues while we're on the topic. Uh, although before we do that, should we play the game? Should we play the statistics game? Maybe we should do that so that we don't take any thund anybody's sure. thunder. Uh, or, or, who wants to go? Uh, so the game, of course, which by the way, I've been doing quite well at, uh, you know, recently I'm just pointing out uh, for everyone. And that's why Ryan's trash talking me mm -hmm. ad nauseum now. Uh, so uh, the game is we each, state a statistic, the rest of the group tries to figure out what that is through questions and clues and deductive reasoning. Uh, the best question, or excuse me, the best statistic is one that isn't um, so easy. We get it quickly. One, one, we also don't want it too hard that no one can get it. And then the bonus is if it's related to the topic at hand, which obviously is jobs, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it can be anything that's you know relevant or most recent. So who wants to go first? Uh, there might be a first mover advantage here because maybe hey, we uh, should let Dante or Marissa go first. Okay. Uh, Dante, you want to go first? Oh, I did you go, go first. first? Did I went first with you first? No, let's go with Marissa. Marissa, you go first. That's fine. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. 4,536,000. 4, million five hundred. Oh, what? Chris has it? Chris? You say? That yeah, you Chris. could. That was it. All right. Wow. Oh. Oh Good my job, goodness. Chris. A yeah. cowbell right off the bat. There you go. Here we go. Yeah, there you got it. Uh, so, Mar Marissa, you want to explain? Yeah, this is from the Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey. Um, it is the highest number of people quitting a job in a single month that's ever been recorded since the inception of the survey, which goes back to the early, early 2000. Um, so, <laughs> kind of showing that the job market is still, you know, as Dante said, um, still really humming along. I mean, people must feel pretty confident still, despite the environment of high inflation, right, in order to quit jobs. So it's a good, um, it's a good indicator of people's confidence in their, their ability to get another job. So is the quit rate, uh, the number of people quitting uh, just percent of the labor force up across the board, across kind of all industries. I think we have it at a state level too. I don't know if you've looked at the state level data. Is it is it pretty much up across the board? I think so across industries. Dante, you probably looked at it more than I have. I don't know about the regional detail mm -hmm. though. I know relative to like a 2019 average, quit rates are higher in every industry than they were prior to the pandemic still. Um, you know, some industries obviously much more than others, but yeah, they're definitely up still across the board. Right. And we've talked about this in the past, but you know, what's your sense is, is these, are these high quit rates here to stay or is this just a function of the current idiosyncratic uh, character of the, of the labor market? What do you think, uh, Marissa? I I think it's, yeah, I think it is still an abnormal sort of functioning labor market. Um, and just given the number of job openings, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an extremely strong job market across the board. And I would expect if we, if the economy does start to slow, we're going to see people stay in their jobs. People also know that if they switch jobs, they can get a huge raise, right? And I'm sure that that's, factoring into it as well. People are seeing the, the increases in salary people are getting if they move from one company to another. So that's a huge incentive to quit. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think that there's any, I can't think of any structurally what, what about significant reason. What about remote work? You know, the ability to connect, you know, via LinkedIn and switch jobs without, you know, leaving your home. So you're saying the friction 
in the labor market is is yeah, is less reduced. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point too. I guess if you don't have to pick up and move across the country for a job and you can just stay put, that makes it a lot easier to decide to leave your job. Yeah. Or take a job with an employer in Paris or yeah. Dubai or wherever, right? Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Right? You can work from anywhere. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah. Hey, uh, the other key, st- and I hope I'm not stealing anyone's thunder, is the other key statistic in the JOLTS survey was unfilled positions. I, th- I think we at least alluded to it a couple times already. They, were, I think they were at record high. It was record high too, wasn't it? 11 and a half million? Something yep. like that. Right. Job right. openings, yeah. Yeah, job openings. Yeah. Sorry. Unfilled positions. Let me ask you a question about that. It just, uh, I, I, you may not know the answer, but could it be the case that because the labor market has been so tight since the economy reopened a year ago with the vaccines, it felt like everyone put up, every business put up a help wanted sign at the same time as the economy reopened. That did businesses just don't want to take it, take those, those, those uh, help wanted signs back down again, because they just, you know, they, they just are nervous that they might not be able to find qualified workers, even if they're really don't need to fill that unfilled, that unfilled position at this point. Uh, they just keep it there just in case because quits are high and, you know, they're just, maybe someone's going to quit next mm-hmm. month and I just want to keep that unfilled position there. So, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, you get where you go, you hear what you sense where I'm going, maybe that unfilled, the number of un, record number of unfilled positions isn't quite what it seems to be. It's not the intensity of the demand that seems to suggest isn't quite as high. Do you have, do you have a sense, anyone have a sense of that? Review on that. I or, or I would agree. Off base? No, I think I mean, and I've even heard of anecdotally companies hiring people in certain industries and then immediately cutting their hours back because they don't need as many people as they hired, but they don't oh, want to really? lay anybody off. However, I would think that that would happen normally in a hot job market, regardless of the reason, right? So if you if you go back to other times where the unemployment rate has been extremely low and job openings high. You, I, I would expect that there'd be some amount of labor hoarding, to put it, you know, in that well, way. Well, unfortunately, I, I don't think we have this data back to the last time the labor market was really excruciatingly tight. You know, around Y two K. I think this this begins in that in that. It does. Right? It begins yeah. in yeah, very early. Yeah. yeah. So we only have one other. Well, I guess we have two business cycles that we can look at, but. Yeah, but I mean, even going into the pandemic, the labor market was was quite tight. I mean, the unemployment rate yeah. was was lower than it is now. When I think unfilled positions peak <clears> out, correct me if I'm wrong, Dante, but like seven and a half, eight million, you know, something like that. Not 11 and a half, but it was you know, pretty elevated. Right. It was an all time high before the pandemic, yeah. but now it's yeah. an all time high. That's sort yeah. of stratospheric. Yeah. The other thing I wonder about unfilled positions is whether it's just easier to post them you know everything is yeah. electronic you know so just it's easy there's no costs right it's not like i you know it used to be the case back in the day i, I had to you know put an ad in the newspaper help you know the people forget this but that was like a big business at one point help wanted ads you know in the paper i mean that, that generated billions of dollars for the newspaper industry that's completely evaporated so the costs we're doing this are pretty low i think for employers you know to post jobs i don't know just a, another thought, but I, I'm, I just wonder whether kind of the underlying level of, of oh, oh, you know, uh, positions, op- open positions is just higher now because of, you know, these changes that have occurred. To that yeah, point, was- does anyone know how the uh, data is actually collected? I, I wonder if uh, you, uh, the same position might be posted in uh, multiple sites, right? Is there any chance of double counting or how mm, is it? Do they I go to the sort, is- to the employer? And- yeah, yeah, it's based like on the establishment yeah. level. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Dante. Explain it. Yeah, so it's a it's based on the same you know establishment type survey as the the payroll report. Um, it's a much smaller survey, but yeah, they're going to the source of the posting. So even if you're posting the same position across you know five or six different services, you know that should be counted as one open position. Um, you know the one thing I have wondered to your earlier point, Mark. You know, I, I would get the sense that companies may be more inclined to keep like evergreen postings up yeah. you know, because of yeah. quit rate being so high yeah. because of turnover being so much higher. You're trying to build a pipeline of people, even if you don't have an opening today, you know, you still want to collect resumes in the hope that if you have an opening next week, you're sort of ready to go to try to fill that. Um, so I certainly think, you know, it just seems strange to me that openings have stayed, you know, essentially the same for yeah. a year, despite adding, 
you yeah. know, how jobs, 5 million jobs over the last year, you know, is labor demand really increasing at that rapid of a rate that openings haven't come in at all since we've had strong job growth? Um, it just yeah. seemed and so I'm very skeptical, you know, kind of the, uh, we were talking about this with Jared Bernstein uh, from the Council of Economic Advisors a couple of weeks ago. The, the, there's this new way of looking at the labor market, just to add up the number of jobs plus the unfilled positions and then compare that to, you know, labor supply. And I don't know that that, I, this doesn't feel right to me in the context of what we've been discussing, that this feels like the number of unfilled positions is just going to be perennially high, in, you know, as a result of these, you know, dynamics we just discussed. Yes, I was looking at that measure of labor demand this morning, you know, openings plus employment. And, you know, if you take, you know, the pre-pandemic level and you sort of grow it out by the 2019 growth rate, yeah. you know, we wouldn't be nearly as high as we are today, which feels strange, right? To say that labor demand is higher today than it would have been in the absence of the pandemic. That just doesn't yeah. seem That's to a make a lot point. of sense. Yeah. That's an excellent point, actually. That's a fantastic point. Right. Yeah. You guys are good. Um, that was my stat. <laughs> Which was sorry, Chris. A five point six million. That's the uh, jobs to workers gap. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Sorry about that. You got. Hopefully, no, you have the same. I got oh, a backup. I got it. Let's back go up. to you. Oh. Let's go to you next. No. <laughs> sorry, Chris, we're using to def define labor supply. Oh, the um. Oh, let me check my notes. Uh, yeah, labor force. Yeah, labor force. Shouldn't we add in? You know, the number of people that are not in the labor force but want a job. Yeah. So that's a that's a pool. Of, and when you do that, that gap shrinks. Right. Right. Well, anyway, before we go to the, the, the next person in the game, this does bring up another question, which it may be becoming a little bit more academic, but I think still somewhat important is full employment. Are we at full employment? Um, you know, a lot of things would say, yeah, I mean, the record number of open positions, the record quit rate, uh, you know, would all indicate the strong wage growth, you know, would indicate that we're at full employment. But are we at full employment? I mean, can the economy be creating four to 500,000 jobs each and every month if we were at full employment? That doesn't seem plausible to me, right? So what do you, what do you think? Uh, Marissa, do you think we're at full employment? No, but I think we're really close. Okay, so um, it's academic almost is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think the the month on month pace of sustain, sustained job growth that we're seeing suggests that there's a lot of people out there that we can still hire. So until you see that tick down meaningfully, um, then, then I don't think we're there yet. If we can still keep creating almost half a million jobs every single month on net, then that suggests there's some slack out there still. Right. I don't think we're going to get back to the participation rate that we had prior to the pandemic, but it seems that there's still a supply of labor out there, particularly among prime aged people that could come back into the labor force. And even though, as I said at the top of the podcast, that the pace of wh at which that's happening seems to be slowing, there's still people out there um, that I think could come back in. And Ryan, I think you, based on your favorite indicator, which I'll let you articulate, I, I, would, I would guess you don't think we're at full employment. No, I don't think so. I mean, before, I mean, prime age employment to population ratio, yeah. so those 25 to 54, Tick down in April, uh, not a lot, but it just edged a little bit lower and we're below 80. I think if we can get north of 80 on a consistent basis. And then you mentioned those that are not in the labor force but want, to, want a job is still a million higher than it was pre-pandemic. And those that are permanent job losers are still higher than it was pre-pandemic. So I think I agree with Marissa, we're close. We'll get there you know, by the end of the year, but we still have a, you know some, some ways to go. Okay. Dante, Chris, do you disagree with that assessment? That we're close, not quite there yet. Increasingly, an academic question, I guess, because if we're not there yet, we're going to be there pretty darn, pretty darn soon. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think we're quite there, but yeah, I think it's close. Yeah, hey, and the other thing, the odds are on our side. I mean, how often is the economy really at full employment? You know, at least historically. You know? So right, it's safe to take the bet that we're not at full employment. Say it again. 
I was just saying, if you look historically, yeah, it's rare for the economy to be at full employment. Right. So, you know, if you're a betting person, it's better to take the odds that we're not at full employment. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And you are a betting person. I know. I am not. You are not. A I am the most risk adverse person in the world. Is that right? I did not know mm-hmm. that. Did you know that, Chris? Did I did not. Yeah. I assumed he was. But, uh, <laughs> How do I give off the persona that I'm a, a gambling per- or wagering? You're person? always talking odds. You know, seventy five percent. Because I'm an economist. Three percent that. You know. I, you know. It's my day job. I guess you're a baseball guy too. So. I am a big baseball guy. guy. They're always gamblers. Those baseball guys. <laughs> trash talkers. Trash talkers highly correlated with with the uh, you know r- risk on kind of people. On the Pete Rose of, of the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, let me ask you one more question then before we move on to the, back to the game. Again, related to are we at full employment? How do you square that we're not at full employment with a strong wage growth? How can we have such strong wage growth if we're not in full employment? Because we have high inflation. Okay. All oh. right. Yep. That's the answer. That would be my answer, right? Mm-hmm. So, so the wage growth, the strong wage growth reflects this very high rate of inflation that's, and it, we've been discussed it ad nauseum and debated, but largely the result of supply side shocks, supply chain disruptions, and of course, what's going on with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and higher oil prices. And so workers are saying, look, I got to pay a lot more to w- commute to work. You know, I feel my, it's costing me four buck 40 cents at the local Wawa here to fill my gas tank and food costs are up because diesel prices are up. So uh, you need to, you employer need to pay me more to compensate for that for me to come into work mm-hmm. yeah okay and and and, and uh business say fine no problem uh, at least up to this point in time yeah okay uh okay uh, let's go on with the game uh marissa i'd have to say your your uh your statistic was pretty weak it, you know thanks um, mark Yep, it was weak because it was just oh, too yeah. damn easy. Weak the- because easy. why? Because it was too easy? Too easy, too easy, too easy. Oh, See, here's okay. the trash talk. See? Right? I'll try to add to that. I got it. Oh, damn, yeah, I forgot the thumper principle. <laughs> yeah, you need to re- yeah. rewatch Bambi. It doesn't feel like a very yeah, strong well, I gotta rewatch Bambi. Bambi. Yeah. All right. Dante, I, had an, I had two, and I went with that one. Oh, the, you would probably oh. not like the other one I picked either. Oh, we can, we can come back to that if we've got time. But Dante, you go next. I'll see if I can make it even worse then. I'll, I'll try to lower the bar further. Um, seven and a half percent. The number, the number, Negative of, seven and a half. The number <laughs> of people that are teleworking because of the pandemic. The percent of people teleworking because of the pandemic. I think it's close to that, but that's not what it I'm is. thinking. About. Chris, you're no, right. I think it's exactly it's seven. Funny. No, it's yeah. it's negative. It, it is negative. I, I left the negative out on purpose because I didn't want to. Well, hold you. it. What? No, now I'm totally confused. Wait, on, negative. What's... Negative seven and a half percent. Wait, is this productivity? Negative. It's productivity. Yeah. Oh. Quarter yeah. to quarter. Yeah. Quarter yeah, you, you yeah. lowered the bar. Yeah, you you're lowered, now in the basement. You really that lowered the, work. the bar, man. Yeah, that's that terrible. Oh, it's the, the oh, largest that... decline since the late 1940s. Yeah, 1947. Largest annualized decline since the late 1940s. So oh. I'm just, you know, throwing it out there for our conversation later. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying, to... you got to bring your A game to this thing, you know? We, we, Sometimes we you got to throw an overhand softball. You quarter to quarter changes okay. on productivity. No, I'm only joking. You That's a good he one. also Chris, left you know? the negative sign yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, intentionally, that was intentional because I didn't want Chris to Oh, it was that. intentional. Yeah, uh-huh. that was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm totally confused. Why? Uh-huh. That, that was the point. That was the point. Oh. And Marissa's <laughs> right, actually. I think seven and a half percent is the number of people that said they it telework is. because of COVID this month, didn't they? Or that was if it's not that, that was a pretty good decline, I think, too, wasn't it? That was a pretty big drop from yeah, it was yeah, 10 like ten to it was ten and a half. Yeah, that's I think that statistic's in. meaningless, but uh, oh, really? It, yeah. Yeah. Why? Why do you think that's meaningless? Uh, because if you look at the question, you know, the way they word the question, I think it's very at this point very open to how you interpret that question like if somebody asked you why you're working yeah. from yeah, home good point. Good point. and is that because of covid what would you yeah. say at this point uh at this point i'd say not because of covid but right it's a, it's a, but it's a good question i could have answered it the other way yeah because mm-hmm. that was the that's yeah. why that's your you're point. able to work from home originally exactly. but yeah. At this yeah. point, it's not really directly because of COVID. So that's a great point. So the number of people who are actually working at home is many, many times higher than that. In all, Absolutely. In all yeah. 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 All right. 
right? I think, I think some of the data I've seen are 20 percent ish, 20, even in size, 25 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so Dante, back to you, seven and a half percent decline in quarter to quarter in productivity in Q4. No, was that Q4 or no, Q1? Q1. Q1, Q1, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, what's going on there? Why is that an important statistic? Well, it's for our ongoing debate about what productivity growth is going to look like moving forward. You know, it just adds to the support for my case of weak productivity growth. You know, the as I sent you earlier last night, the, you know, coming out of this recession, productivity growth is weaker than it's been coming out of the last three recessions already. And over the last six quarters, it's basically been flat, right? It was only really up the first two or three quarters. And that was almost certainly compositional, right? You lost all of these jobs in, you know, sort of low value added industries, which boosted up productivity. And then, you know, over the last year and a half, it's basically done absolutely nothing. So Brian keeps telling me to just hold on and wait that it's it's coming, it's coming, but I don't, how long do we wait before it's not coming anymore? Well, with productivity, you got to wait a lot more than six quarters. I mean, that data is really but volatile. With the number of job openings and, you know, how much incentive there is for firms to find ways to increase productivity, mm -hmm. shouldn't, shouldn't we be seeing something in a year and a half in, you know, in yeah, that's what, I mean, it's, business well, look at, it happened sooner. You know? Yeah. But look at business this? investment in intellectual property it is going through the roof. That's, I think, a better indication than productivity. Because that drives productivity. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you, Dante, you, you would, I'm sure, agree that that 7.5% down was kind of an outlier because of the wacko GDP number we got. So, so productivity basically is I take GDP output, the growth in that, and I subtract the growth in labor hours, the number of people working in their hours. And businesses are just like a machine hiring, you know, close to 500,000 people a month trying to fill all those positions, but output, at least as measured by GDP, is going up and down and all around quarter to quarter, given Omicron and Russian invasion and that kind of thing, inventory swings and stuff. So it was, it was, it was up big time in fourth quarter of last year, down big time in the first quarter. So they probably, it probably overstates the weakness, but nonetheless, you're saying, even abstracting from that, doesn't feel like we're in this new world of productivity growth. It yeah, it's abstracting from the but yeah, I don't you know down seven and a half percent isn't you know, where we're headed, but you know, I think abstracting from that month quarter to quarter volatility, it just feels like it's very flat or very slow growing compared to what we would have thought it might be. Okay, two things just to push back a little bit, and I and I do agree with Ryan's point about investment spending. I mean that does feel like it suggests that we should have stronger productivity. Not that it's proof positive; it doesn't mean that it necessarily translates. But the first, if I take a five-year moving average of productivity growth, kind of abstracting, certainly from the quarter-to-quarter -quarter movements, but even from the business cycle movements, productivity growth is 1.7, 1.8%, you know, annualized. And that is definitively up from where it was, you know, back in 2015, 16, when it was well south of one. It's, uh, it's up at least a full point, you know, on that basis. So that makes me feel, and by the way, uh, productivity growth, has averaged since World War II, 2%, almost on the nose. So if it's, it feels like we're coming back to something that, you know, is more typical, you know. So how, well, how do you react to that? Well, I'd say, so it was already coming off of that bottom before the pandemic, right? I mean, it was averaging like 1% oh, for yeah, a while. Yeah, 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 recession, yeah. And it was yeah. already coming yeah. off of that, you know, yeah. something like 1.5%. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I, I don't think we're going back to 1%. I think my argument is that we're not headed higher, you know, we're going to stay at that one and a half, maybe 1.6%. I don't think oh, we're I going see. into two, oh. ba you know, back to that 2% average. I see. Um, you we're know, I don't think we're getting this that. boom coming out of the pandemic and to the, you know, intellectual property, I, in my mind, some of that is, isn't some of that just necessary investment because of the pandemic? I had to invest in software and other things to make remote That's work point. possible, mm -hmm. which could lead to productivity gains, but it also could just change the way companies were working and not really lead to a whole lot of gain in productivity. It was just a necessary investment to be able to make that shift to remote work for a lot of people. Yeah. So I don't think it necessarily guarantees we're going to see a boost in productivity moving forward because of that. Right. The other thing I, I kind of just caution is it, you know, that GDP number, my guess is that it's going to get revised oh, yeah, yeah. higher because uh, if you look at GDP compared to gross domestic income, and, and Ryan was pointing this out in some of our email exchanges earlier in the week, GDP has been a lot weaker than GDI, and generally GDP gets revised to GDI, gross domestic, gross domestic income is just another way of measuring output, is looking at people's incomes and profits, kind of the income side of the, of the accounts. GDP is 
as we talk about as really the consumption side of the accounts or the output side of the accounts. And uh, if, and my guess is I'd be pretty surprised if we don't see G GDP, maybe not in Q1 of 2022, but you know, over the past year or two, when we get all the revisions in, that re gets revised higher. Here's the other thing I want to just point out. And I, again, I don't know that there, there, you know anyone would know the answer, but I, it's confusing me a little bit. If you look at the productivity gains for non-financial corporations, so the, the data you were referring to is non-farm uh, business. So right. it's a very broad measure. If I, but if I do non-financial corporations, it's been much, much stronger. Booming, you know? yeah. yeah. Have, have you noticed that? And, and I don't know if, yeah. uh, if that means anything to you. Any reaction to that? Except to say, Mark, you're right, but okay. Other I don't have any particular reaction. Chris, Chris reacted. I don't know if he has anything more to well, say. Chris is shaking his head. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, well, so the difference there is larger companies, right? Isn't that the... Uh... I think so. Primary difference. So, yeah. and, and non financial. I, I don't know. Financial not, might swing things around. I mean, financials might right. swing things around, you know, quarter, certainly quarter to quarter, you know, quite a bit. But, right, mm -hmm. right. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I, I was interpreting that as a large, as the uh, large versus small business productivity growth uh, differences, which I, I think is interesting. We probably should take a closer look at that. Uh, like, who's driving this? Uh, well, who's driving the investment and then who's driving the, Productivity gains. Yeah, it could very well be the larger companies that have been able to capitalize and have had the larger incentive uh, to find more productive ways to to deal with higher wage costs or input costs. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the Dante's got a point. The burden of proof is now shifted. Right? Yes, he does. I mean, yeah. he, I mean, the data is definitely in his his camp at the moment. That productivity growth is going to be more pedestrian. It's volatile though. So. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, and <laughs> you I, and I, keep see, I keep expecting remote it. work to show up in the data, but maybe it's one of those things that you know takes a while to show up in the data, you know, like computers. It took a long like time. Computers, to computers. Yeah. Chips to yeah, show computers. Yeah, you up. always tell that story about how I forget who said it, but they said you know Solo. productivity is everywhere with Except the, the software. Yeah. Yeah, Robert Solo said that. Mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. That's uh, economic folklore. You gotta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay uh, let's, let's move on um chris you want to go next as you can see i'm setting uh, up a real battle between ryan and i here well i was just going to say for the listener <laughs> if you're keeping the score at home mark's zero for two <laughs> well do i have to, uh, look i have to win every single one now it, it, no. actually i have my standards i will not chime in no i'm gonna stop there thumper principle thumper principle. Yep. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, my so my backup was productivity. So now I'm gonna have to go to oh the, my, my second backup. Gracious, no way. Way. We're on we're on the same wavelength, which yeah. I like. Um, but I'm gonna I'll give you the uh overhanded the softball here, Mark. Uh 420, 4.26, 4.26. 4.26. Oh, dot oh, they're going copper. Yep. Wow. Ah. Copper or prices. $4.26 yeah, or yeah. $4.26. Yes. Perfect. Oh, okay. Well, we haven't talked about copper prices in a while, but yeah, they've come in a little bit. They're still high. Anything over four bucks is pretty high. Well, way to go, Ryan. Good job. I think that's a cowbell for Ryan. No, that's, that's easy. That was too easy. Okay. I think Where is you know, the I actually think we're getting pretty right so good at this game that, you know, it's hard to come up with a statistic that is, isn't, you know, too easy. Interesting. Well, I got another one, but it's way no, no, off. But why did you pick that one? Why? So, what's your thought process there? On the it's been a while since we revisit our our recession uh, yep. indicators. We uh -huh. do touch on unemployment insurance claims once in a while. They're still low, a little bump up this week, but nothing major. Um, and then we always talk about the ten year and the uh, and the yield curve, but we haven't talked about copper in a while, which is your favorite. Uh, yeah, yeah. Stat. It, it seems to suggest. No, it, it is weakening. Have, it's down 10% over the year. Yeah, Maybe, maybe it, it's a, uh, not going to be quite as useful as a business cycle barometer because all commodity prices have been shifted higher because of, you know, Russia, Ukraine and disruptions to, to commodity markets. So maybe, although copper shouldn't be that affected by Russia, Ukraine, right? They, they don't produce no. copper. So I'm not sure I do think the bar is set higher now because of electrification. Oh, okay. So yeah, maybe, yeah. I don't know if four dollars is the right benchmark. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, 
Okay, uh, Ryan, you're up. All right, so this one's going to be a little more difficult. Oh, you're going to have to think a little bit outside the box. Is Minus an economic six. statistic, is, uh, you're it's still economics. We're, we're still yeah, we're sticking with economics. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to baseball or hockey nope. or no, no, no. We're staying with college, you know, bit, uh, batting average. Batting average. Okay. Yeah. Okay, All right. Uh, he was one for three last night, though. Oh, okay. that, that, that always makes nothing better than that when your kid's playing well. Yep. All right. Minus 65,000. Minus 65,000. Uh, is it in the employment data? It is. Uh, is it employment for some sector of the economy? No, it's a measure of employment, but not industry. It's not industry. Okay. Specific demographic? Yeah. It is not. Uh, minus 65,000. Uh, is it uh, something in the household survey? It is. It is. Uh, and it's, it's some measure of labor market utilization, some kind of measure of. No, no, it's, no. it's that. Yeah, it's 65,000. It's not a percent. It's down. So just minus. Yeah, right. 65,000. Pandemic related. We've talked about it before. It's kind of like a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult, I'll give you a hint. You have to okay. adjust this number in the household survey. Oh yeah. He's, I remember him talking about this before. Mm -hmm. right? It slips my mind. But Is it, it the employment change adjusted to the payroll survey definition? Is that exactly. Oh, well, that's a good job, Dante. That's that's good great. job, Dante. That's, yeah, that's a little, yeah. So, well, because the, the regular number was down three or four hundred thousand, right? Something right. like that. So, oh, that, if that can be used yeah. for adjustment. That's the first decline since December 2020. Yeah. So, I was kind of looking for indications that job growth or the labor market is losing a little bit of momentum. And this one, if it holds up, you know, and declines again, you know, it may indicate that the, the job market is losing a little bit of momentum. So, so for the listener, explain this you know what do you what do you uh what's the six down 65k what is that all right so dante and marissa may have to <coughs> chime in as well because i may forget one or two things but you take household employment and then you subtract out so you're trying to make household employment an apples to apples comparison with the uh, employment numbers in the establishment survey so that 428,000 increase and to do that the household number you have, you have to subtract out agriculture uh, uh self-employed uh, unpaid home workers, I believe, is also excluded. Family uh, so just, workers. Yep, family People workers. working in a family business, yeah. And now you have a more of an apples-to-apples apples comparison. I mean, this, this adjusted yeah. number in the household survey is still volatile, uh, more mm -hmm. volatile than the employment data, but typically they kind of move in the same directionally in the same way, and that didn't happen in April. Right. You know, I, I, I have noticed, though, uh, since the pandemic, uh, hit. So if you go back and look at employment since the pandemic hit, the household survey has been stronger than the establishment survey. Employment as measured by the household survey has been stronger. And that doesn't last generally for very long. It, no, it doesn't. They, they converge. So maybe this is just part of that it could be. Know, process that's going on. Uh, but that's interesting. So it was uh, down 65K on the household ba basis compared to up for whatever, 29 on the establishment survey. Correct. Yeah, got it. Okay. That, that was good. That was a good, that's, I'm going to have to file that away. That's your kind of a go-to statistic. Of I'll send you the, uh, the mnemonic. So you can okay. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah. I'd like to see that. Okay. I, mm -hmm. I've got one. Um, and I'm, just as a hint, you know, got to think more broadly than the employment report. So I'm now going beyond the employment report and it, in, in, in Marissa's honor, it's a negative 7.4 trillion dollars 7.4 trillion and uh, and dante tua now yeah and now that now dante he claims Tua's to have done that on purpose though <laughs> i don't think he did yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm not sure he did yeah i mean mark are you aren't you getting concerned that a lot of the our economists our, our colleagues are reading positive negative signs and we're economists yeah uh, i do that all the time so no not really yeah no no it's okay as long as they you know they they fess up or, you know, correct. Yeah. Well, sometimes you have in your head, like, this is a, this is a decline, right? Yeah. What was the yeah. decline? 7.4% decline. So sometimes you just, Marissa, just, just that's the unsaid just, part. Just give it up, Marissa. <laughs> give it up. 
I would like to give it up, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) I would very much like to give it up. (laughs) A good point. Someone won't let me. We will never let you give it up. (laughs) That's right. That's hilarious. Uh, And sometime you'll have to tell the the story about swapping the X and Y axes, Mark. I, I'm sure I've told you that many, many times. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know on the podcast. On the podcast? But... All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell it because it's a great story. And oh. this, this, is, this is why, you know, Marissa, uh, you know, I've, no, no harm, no foul. So this is early days, you know, when we started a company. Carl and I, my brother, who runs the business now, we were sitting in front of a terminal and, you know, uh, looking at data. And he plots this data. I can't remember what it was. And I'm looking at it and I'm giving, you know, here, oh, I know why this is happening. Here's five reasons why this is the case. And then he goes, oh, I forgot to multiply by negative one. So everything was flipped on its head. So I had explained actually quite uh, elegantly why this was the case. But it was, you know, obviously just the opposite of what I was saying. So it uh, just goes to show. Okay. Uh, back to my statistic. This is serious business. Minus seven. Did I give you the statistic? Yeah. Minus $7.4 trillion. Minus $7.4 trillion. And this came out this week. This is uh, coming out all the time. This is. This oh, is, it's the treasury. Oh, report. Uh, I, know, I know where he's going. Yeah. So I'll give you a hint. It's market related. Is this the loss? I'll let other people, I, I think I know, where, I know where you're going. No, go ahead, Ryan. No, go ahead. Is this the decline in household wealth because of the drop in the stock market? Well, how to, that decline in, how, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I right. didn't explain it very yeah. good. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I think, yeah, that's exact. I had to di- dissect cipher the way you, you said that, but yes. I was kind of changing my mind as I was answering it. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's the decline in market cap. The capitalization mm-hmm. of the equity market based on the wealth for five thousand. This is really interesting. I, I didn't realize it until I went and calculated it this morning. The stock market's all time high was the first trading day of this of this year. You know, January third, twenty twenty two, is the all time high in the U.S. stock market, and it was in terms of market capitalization, the value of the stocks that are being traded. It was about forty nine trillion dollars, forty nine trillion dollars, and now you know we're down. You know, I, I didn't look today, but based on yesterday's action, which obviously was pretty negative, uh, we're down about fifteen percent from from the peak, and that's seven point four trillion dollars. Uh, that's that's starting to be real money, right? Uh, you know, we talk about the need for financial conditions to tighten in response to the Fed's actions to slow the growth rates in the economy and financial conditions include everything from, you know, long-term interest rates to the value of the dollar to credit spreads, mortgage yields, but also most, or arguably most importantly, the, the equity market and the equity market is down you know, quite a bit. So something to watch. Let me ask you a question. One thing that I'm getting a little nervous about uh, is this is another kind of sort of key recession indicator, right? Yep. Right. Uh, I mean, the first one is the yield curve that on the 10 year, two year tr- basis that inverted two year yields rose above 10 year yields a few weeks ago. <clears throat> That's a kind of a indicator of future recession. And then another really important one is the stock market. You know, that's down. I don't know if 15% is enough of a signal, but you know, what do you guys think of that? Any, any worries, nervousness about by that? Let me also give you a little more context around that. This goes to the, uh, monthly GDP estimates that you, you Ryan, you construct based on uh, uh, monthly data. I don't know if you we got the March da- the March number. The March number was down a lot. And if you look, March GDP is no higher or marginally higher than what it was back in last August. So GDP has actually not gone anywhere since the since August of last year. So, you know, you tie that into all these recession signals. I don't know, should anybody's alarm bells going off yet or premature? What do you think, Chris? Well, Ryan's bell has already been going off yeah, for my, a while, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah his has been going off. Yeah. Going off. Is, it, is yours going off now? That's the Well, I, I'd say so far, this is all still consistent with my probabilities. You know, one third this year, 50, you know, even odds over the next two. It's not quite screaming 
recession, but you know, uh, only one. even odds. You're not bumping that up. Uh... Nah, not yet. Not yet. You're, you're so at 60% or something. What's right? it going to take? What, what, uh, probably a recession actually to occur. <laughs> 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 it might change that it might change something no no look if the stock market goes down 20 25 percent and stays down you know it doesn't go down for a day or two or a week or two was you know down for a quarter or two i'd say that's a pretty strong signal you know something's up uh then i start watching consumer confidence because that's the next thing that'll go if we're on the path to recession so uh, but but something you know very very clearly to watch okay um there was one other question I wanted to ask before we call it a podcast or going back to the labor market is, and this is a question Ryan and I got on a call we did with a, with a large client. What uh, do you look at to gauge whether we are uh, suffering a wage price spiral? So <clears throat> dreaded wage price spiral, wages, uh, inflation drives wages. We already talked about that already happening. But then wages uh, start driving inflation. So service-based companies where labor costs are high see the higher wages and start passing that through to their customers, thinking that you know that's okay because the customer will pay it because they're going to get a bigger wage increase. And you get into this kind of self-reinforcing negative uh, dynamic, which is you know the fodder for stagflation scenarios and certainly recession because the Fed's going to be all over that and just. Uh, raising interest rates aggressively to kind of short circuit that wage price the spiral. We've argued, and we argued on this podcast already, that we're not in a wage price spiral, that so far it's mostly inflation driving wages, but we don't see evidence of wages driving prices. But what is it that you look at to gauge whether that's actually the case or not? Any, any views on that? Ryan, how would you answer that question? Well, one thing I've been looking at, and I don't know if I'm thinking about it the right way, is that the conference board, consumer confidence survey, they have that labor market differential, which is the percent of consumers that say jobs are plentiful, mine is hard to get. And that's among the highest in, uh, on record. In the same survey, they have income expectations. So you know, the, what percent of consumers expect their incomes to be higher in the next six months, mine is lower. And that's among the lowest. So consumers are really optimistic about the labor market, but very pessimistic about their future incomes, which would argue that maybe they don't think feel that comfortable asking for higher wages. So that would argue against a wage price spiral. What do you think of that, Chris? Does that resonate with that's, you? That's reasonable. That's okay. reasonable. I, I guess more fundamentally, I would look at the prices of the various services versus goods, right? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing faster price increases in the service sector versus goods sector? Right. And so far you'd say no. That's not so far. I say no, but yeah, maybe changing. Yeah. yeah, I think by and large, the uh, service providers have been eating the increased cost to some degree, right? So they're not passing all of the prices through, right? Okay, Dante, Marissa, any what would you look at to gauge whether wage price spirals is, is uh, starting to, to unfold? Anything? I think you it takes some time, right? We need to see how things unfold over a little bit longer horizon, especially as some of the other factors influencing inflation get wrung out a little bit, hopefully. You know, if those factors start to wane in and you see inflation still staying elevated, you know, and with wage growth seemingly leveling off, you know, that would sort of lend some you know, credence to the idea that we're not going to see that spiral happen. But if you'd see some of those external factors get wrung out of inflation, but you know, overall inflation still ticking up higher, then certainly that would set off alarm bells for me. But that's just going to take some time to see that. Yeah. So, so inflation, right, inflation is juiced because of these one-off, you know, spiking oil prices, vehicle prices. They come in, and we, but we don't see wage growth come in with it. But, but in that case, I mean, if if wage growth is up because of the inflation, you would think as the wage growth moderates, we'd see wage growth moderate well. But I guess what you're saying is, if that does not happen, then right. that's a bad sign. Yeah. That's a bad sign. Okay. Marissa, anything uh, that you would point to? Those are all really good. Uh, I would just say how broad based are wage gains, you know, once yeah. you start mm -hmm. to see it spreading from exactly. a few key yeah. industries where we know that the market is very tight to kind of just an all over, uh, you know, right now there's a huge differential, say in restaurants, hotels, leisure, hospitality, wage gains over the year, are like 15%. 
or something like that the last time I looked, which was a month ago. Whereas on average for other industries, it's like four or 5%. So uh, until you start to see kind of everything moving up, I, I, I'm less worried about it being a pervasive problem. That was the answer I gave, right, Ryan, on the, on the yeah. call. You know, I, I brought up the Atlanta wa Fed wage tracker, yeah. which again, I keep touting, go Google Atlanta Fed wage tracker, and they give you, they follow the same workers and track their wages to, and it mixes, it corrects for the mix effects or accounts for the mix effects. And uh, if you look at wage growth across the wage distribution, uh, most or vast majority of the acceleration in wage growth has been in for jobs at the in the bottom half of the distribution of wages. In the top half, it's not been the case. And you look across age, you know, older workers like me, you know, they're boomers. Their wage growth has not, you know, accelerated to any significant degree, or maybe a little bit on the margin, but nothing, nothing major. The other the other thing I brought up, and um, maybe Ryan, you can explain this. Ryan does this really cool Granger causality test. You know, there's an, this kind of a statistical test that looks at leads and lag relationships between variables to see who, what's, who's causing who or, or, or not. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Ryan, but that, those uh, causality tests that you run continue to show that inflation prices are driving wages, but wages have, at least in a, up to this point, not been driving prices. That's correct. Right? And I use the proxy for wages is the employment cost index. So, so right. far, inflation is leading uh, changes in the ECI, the employment cost index, by one to two quarters. Right. Okay. And the causation runs one way because you can have instances where you know there's a causal relationship that goes both ways. But this way, so far, it's uh, inflation driving wages. And you should be pretty proud of me because on that call, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I did a pretty good advertisement for Inside Economics on that call. So you I did. You made a very I good pitch. I picked up a few listeners along the way. Which, and I don't know if you guys are, are doing that or not, but I think you should if you're if you're not. Uh, I get pretty. I, I take advertisement breaks in the middle of these these uh, presentations that I do uh, to talk about that and Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is <laughs> at Mark Zandy. Uh, follow me. And Mr. Sweet, uh, what's your Twitter handle? At real time underscore econ. Yeah. And that's where he trash talks me, by the way. Uh, really got to got to keep up with that. I think we need a uh, another opinion of trash talking. I, Mar Marissa may have to look at it and tell me if I'm right. I've seen talking. it. I've seen it. You're really enjoying Twitter, I see. Yeah. Well, it, isn't that trash talking? Is anyone doing? Oh, look, a, yeah, absolutely. 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 He's, go, he's goading you into a argument yeah. over Twitter. It's all in, in fun. Of course it I know, is. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tr isn't trash talking all in fun generally? Mm, no. mm, okay. Not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so Mercy, you're on Twitter. Yeah. Do you, do you tweet? No. Oh, no. Okay. I just follow people. Okay. All righty. And, and Dante, are you on Twitter? You don't strike me as a Twitter fellow, but... Like Marissa, I'm an observer. I use it You're to digest observer. news okay. and information. All right. and, and Chris, of course, Chris is LinkedIn. The LinkedIn maven. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Very good. Uh, well, I, I think any, any other things anybody wants to bring up at this point? No? Okay. Well, besides watching Bambi. Watch the... <laughs> watch Bambi. Homework for next week. For no, you, Netflix. Right? Watch The Hunt for the Crypto King. Oh, Yeah. You mentioned that. Okay, Made me think of Chris. Theory. Is that a yeah, biography of Chris Dorides? Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's the rumor. That's, that's yep. what we've heard. Yeah. The hunt's going to end in Chester County. Jeez. Ooh. So on that dark note, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to call this a podcast. It was a very good podcast, uh, but thank you listener for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week. Take care now. <laughs>